So today's topic uh, we're very excited about is entitled Revisioning His Chinese History from the years 900 to 1350, A New Look at the Song and Yuan Periods. Our guest speaker is Dr. Linda Walton. She is Professor Emerita at Portland State University History Department. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, hi, everyone. Um, also, again, welcome to our talk this morning. Um, Professor Emerita Linda Walton retired from Portland State University's History Department in 2013 after 35 years of teaching Chinese, East Asian, and world history. Um, 32 of them were at PSU. She also chaired the history department there for six years. Uh, Dr. Walton also established the PSU Institute for Asian Studies and served as its director for three years. She was editor of the Journal of Song Yuan Studies for three years. Post-retirement, Dr. Walton has continued research in Song Yuan intellectual and social history, along with pursuing a more recent research interest in Confucian academies in contemporary China as cultural heritage sites. She was visiting professor at Hunan University's Weilu Academy Research Institute from 2018 to 2020. And pandemic permitting, she will be visiting research professor in 2022 at the University of Edinburgh as part of the European Research Council project on classical cultures in Song China in Byzantium. Uh, Dr. Walton has been a longtime supporter of First Saturday PDX, and we are very excited to have her back. Uh, she last presented with us in 2014 uh, about the Confucian sacred landscapes. And so again, we are very pleased to have her return to us uh, to talk on this intriguing subject. Linda, please take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy everyone is here and I appreciate your attendance. I can only think that dreary weather and pandemic isolation has contributed to a uh, desire to zoom in on a talk about periodization, at least in part. Um, so I wanted to say a couple of things about the title of this to begin with. Uh, revisioning uh, was intended on my part to re-envisioning thinking about a new way of um, imagining Song and Yuan uh, and the period 900 to 1350 uh, is roughly that, not exactly, but we'll be talking about um, what that precisely means uh, throughout the course of, of this morning. Um, I'm using here, uh, many people will recognize this very famous scroll as a, a visual element. Um, the scroll itself um, is very well known and, and there's a great deal of debate about its meaning, but I wanted to reassure any art historians in the audience that I am well aware that um, paintings are not representations of historical reality and I will not use them that way, but I will occasionally use a painting to um, represent what people looked like at the time. Um, so I will, uh, you know, still make use of them. So let's begin. I, I wanted to, um, through this talk, really highlight, um, provide an overview for people, share with you um, the fruits of my own experience in tackling a project of writing a history of China from 900 to 1350, which I took on as um, a retirement project because I thought it would be a way for me to read up on all the new scholarship and I've learned a great deal. So what I'm going to talk about today is largely based on the work that other people have done, but I, I hope it will be meaningful to people and maybe inspire some new ways of thinking about China's past during these centuries. So I'd like to begin with the um, dry topic, I think to a lot of people, of periodization. And by matters, I mean, it, it. I'm going to deal with issues of periodization, but also I want to emphasize the point that um, it matters, it is important because all historians or anyone who thinks about history uh, uses some kind of periodization. And I know everyone in this audience, I'm sure is familiar with dynasty as a term used typically in Chinese history, but it's also used elsewhere, referring to a line of rulers. Um, 
theoretically blood descendants, but not always. Uh, and this has given birth to, in, in the very earliest Chinese historical records, um, the Chinese dynastic cycle, which I prefer to think of more as a spiral, giving a, a sort of cyclical shape to China's past, but one in which um, not exactly um, each cycle replicates precisely. So spiral, I think, describes it a little bit better. But over time, as Chinese historians recorded the past um, and did it in dynastic chunks, dynasties developed characteristics, uh, they developed anthropomorphic life stages. So there was birth, maturation, and death. And if we look at the Song dynasty in these terms, I'm talking here about a, a, a quite conventional view of the Song period from 960 to 1279, the nor divided, subdivided into the Northern Song and the Southern Song. Um, the Song founders were vigorous leaders. You can see portraits of them as martial leaders, but later rulers, as in most dynasties, are always portrayed as weak and inept. Um, in the Song also, one of the conventional tropes of Song history is the triumph of Wen, uh, the civil over the military, Wu. And we'll be talking about um, how that uh, vision of the Song has been modified later this morning. But I wanted to, um, just as an example, highlight the bad last emperor paradigm in the person of Emperor Huizong, who reigned over the Song um, and the loss of the North to the Jurchen Jin in the first quarter of the 12th century. And this is a very well-known portrait of Huizong, who was presented typically as an effete, dissipated, a uh, patron of the arts and also of Taoism, but I, I just to show a little bit here, I have a, an example of his very, very famous calligraphic style, the so-called slender gold uh, for which he was known. And I might just briefly point out that Patricia Ibri, a very path-breaking scholar in so many ways in the Song period, has um, a hefty tome, a very large um, study of Huizong that considerably revises this typical view of him as the effete, weak, last emperor of, of the northern Song. And so if we look at a, a map of the Song as a whole, we can see both the northern and southern here indicated by the dotted line roughly along the Huai River, the division between North and South, once the North was conquered by the Jin in 1126, just to give you a sense of the political boundaries of this song. And this will be important because we're going to look backward a little bit at the Tang and then forward, of course, into the Mongol Yuan. So being conscious of how these borders are drawn to designate uh, Song territory. But also here on this map, you can see it's surrounded by uh, other um, nomadic pastoral states, uh, the Liao and then later the Jin in the north, the Xia to the northwest, the Tibetans to the west, the state of Nanjiao to the southwest, and even though this map is somewhat inaccurate, Anam to the south by the Song period was really more appropriately Dai Viet, um, because the um, people who founded Dai Viet had gained independence from, um, the, from China in um, the 10th century, so they were still um, closely tied, but not really um, controlled in any sense by China at the time. Finally, the Mongol period, this map also shows then the extent of the Mongol Empire. Um, and the that's quite probably familiar to most people with its borders also uh, shown here um, extensively. And Sorry, this is spreading right ahead. Um, the Mongols are typically seen as having take advantage, taken advantage of the Song military weakness to conquer all of the Song, uh, as well as much of Eurasia. And this very much fits with the traditional view of the Song as culturally vibrant, but militarily weak. 
um, the Mongol Yuan, then just to look forward in time in terms of dynasties, was replaced in turn by the native Ming, which in its own turn was replaced in the mid 17th century by the Manchu Qing. Um, in conventional, um, now outdated portrayals, sinicized conquerors who adapted their rule to the ways of China in order to preserve their own uh, three century rule until the early 20th century. Okay, well, that dynastic um, quick trip through these centuries, I want to turn now to ways of um, going beyond the dynastic configuration that began to develop already early in the 20th century. And so in the early 20th century, Chinese historians um, tried to adapt dynastic chronology to a much more linear evolutionary one in order to try to fit China's history in with Western or world history. And at that time, world history was really understood as Western history. So if we think of the basic chronology in terms of Western history, ancient, medieval, modern, um, so there was an attempt to see what was ancient in China, what was medieval, and what was modern. But we're still dealing here with a, a timeline that leads to modernity to a modern world defined by the West. One of the most important um, historians to develop this kind of uh, linear chronology and to really um, go beyond the ancient medieval modern was the Japanese sinologist Naito Konan, who um, did most of his work in the early 20th century and saw this song as the beginning of what he called modern Kinsei in Japanese China, because it had features like those leading to the modern world. Uh, industry, commerce, urbanism. And so he identified China in this period as, as beginning a kind of modern era. And so his work became the foundation of what we have come to know um, conventionally now as the Tang Song transition. So crossing these dynastic boundaries, um, focusing on five centuries, and this would be a huge chunk of time to any European historian, but um, for those of us working on China, these five centuries are identified as a crucial watershed in China's history. Um, beginning in the 1970s, and with a, a work by Mark Elvin, The Pattern of the Chinese Past, um, there began to be a, a great deal of scholarship using this idea of the Tang Song transition. Elvin's book was subtitled A Social and Economic Interpretation, um, and he really synthesized a great deal of Chinese and Japanese scholarship uh, to, uh, to make the, the foundation of this book. And in the 1970s, together with Elvin's book that really popularized this view, at least to historians, of the Tang Song transition, um, people began to adopt uh, a, a new periodization framework, uh, early imperial, which would refer to the formation of the very first empire in the third century BCE to about the third century CE. And then from the middle imperial period, the reunification in the Sui Tang period in the sixth, seventh centuries up through uh, the end of the of the Song and the and the Yuan periods that, that we're talking about today. So the middle imperial period is what we're going to talk about today. The later imperial period is um, conventionally simply the Ming and, and Qing dynasties. So there are um, one of the ways to think about the development of the field, and I hope people are interested in that as well. Um, it also tells us a lot about how thinking has changed in viewing the Song period. In the 1970s as well, um, an organization was created, Society for the Study of Song Yuan and Conquest Dynasties. Um, it was Europe, some European scholars and um, US scholars uh, and gradually began to incorporate scholars from Asia and other parts of the world. Um, just this past year in 2021, this journal published uh, that was uh, part of the, this society 
published its 50th anniversary uh, volume. And the journal started out as a, a, a newsletter, became a bulletin, and finally a journal. So it speaks to the development of a field of Song studies, um, not just history, but literature, but um, all, all areas, ancillary disciplines studying the Song period. Uh, so the flourishing of, of Song history um, could be seen in this beginning in the 1970s, uh, in Asia, in Europe, and in the United States, and in, in uh, North America as well. And in the late 20th century, by the late 20th century, we also see the beginning of um, studies, really intensification of studies of the Kitan Liao, the Jurchen Jin, the Tangut Shisha, and the Mongol Yuan. And to some extent, I think this is a product of um, interest in cultural diversity, um, but also in China, for, for scholars working in China, um, political concerns with minority peoples and particularly how to fit the histories of minority peoples into a national narrative of China's history. And that, of course, could be a contentious and very complicated uh, uh, issue. Simultaneously, studies of the Yuan in the context of the Mongol Empire and of steppe empires in general as global as a global historical phenomenon really began to um, develop and to increase as well. So the terminology used here, and it's still used, although everybody who belongs to this society now uh, certainly wouldn't accept the idea of conquest dynasties, but that, that term continues to be used in the name. So let's talk a little bit uh, more closely about what middle imperial then means if we think about it um, in the terms of this five century chunk of time between the mid Tang and the end of the Song and uh, founding of the, of the Yuan dynasty. It really refers to the beginnings of it, uh, start with a mid eighth century rebellion in the 750s that began to weaken Tang power. And this map of the Tang I just used to illustrate um, the extent of Tang power with this dark black line. And the dotted line shows a, a protectorate, a kind of area that the Tang claimed dominance over but didn't directly control. Um, I also use this smaller map, though, to just indicate that the Tang was far more than political influence on the Asian continent, but cultural influence, as many people I'm sure in the audience are aware, during the Tang era uh, was very important on the Korean Peninsula and in Japan as well, and uh, a great deal of influence from the so-called Tang model can be seen in the institutions and cultural uh, developments within both the Korean Peninsula and Japanese archipelago during this era. Um, one other political point then that's important here in this period, in the Middle Imperial period, of course, is the reunification, the unification of the empire under the Song period in a much more uh, truncated uh, territorial sense. But the Song also represents the culmination of the economic and social transformations generated in the mid 8th century, but circumscribed as the Song was politically by the rise of nomadic states and empires on its border. Before we turn back to further discussion with the Tang Song uh, and particularly the Song period, I wanted to just introduce, though, another um, trans dynastic framing of Chinese history that uh, was brought out in a conference volume published in 2003, um, carrying this notion of a transition further from Song Yuan Ming. Um, making the point, as the editors of, of this volume did Paul Smith and Richard Van Gaan, that um, the Yuan had really been 
uh, ignored by historians of China, not ignored exactly, but um, they tended to just view it as kind of an interruption between the Song and the Ming, um, uh, sort of stuck in there between <clears throat> for about a century, just interrupted the flow of China's history. And to encourage people to um, pay more attention to, to really begin to develop studies that look seriously at the UN as part of the flow of, of China's history and to try to do something to close this artificial chasm between Song and Ming. And so I just wanted to bring that up as another example of how historians have thought about uh, trans-dynastic uh, chronologies uh, and for what reasons they might do this. So turning back again then to, as, to the Tang Sung transition in a little more detail, uh, what are the features that made um, Naito, Konan, and people in the 1970s and after really begin to think about the Tang Sung transition in terms of, of the economy in the Sung? Population growth was huge uh, from about 60 million in the Tang to about 100 million in the Song. And if that population growth was fueled by agricultural expansion um, the, in terms of technology, but also arable land, the expansion of arable land, improvements in crops and so on. So people were fed, population grew, but there was also then a commercial revolution that in part was dependent on the um, growing population because there were um, more markets to distribute goods uh, there was a money uh, economy, uh, monetization of the economy, and probably well known to many of you, the introduction of paper currency um, that was of tremendous importance, not only in China, but also in world history. Uh, the developments of markets of many different scales, not just markets in major urban centers, but throughout the countryside at uh, located along major transportation routes and so on. So marketization of the economy, urbanization, the density of populations, not only in the capitals of Kaifeng and Hangzhou, but in, in other regional cities, coastal port cities and so on that saw an increasing population um, living together in close quarters. And I, I've highlighted here on the right-hand side of the screen um, a couple of sources that are probably known to some of the audience at least, a very important, the Dungjing Meng Hua Lu, the uh, Dreaming of Splendor in the Eastern Capital of this about the Northern Song capital of Kaifeng in the mid uh, 12th century. Uh, written in the mid 12th century, and then a subsequent one written um, near the end of the Southern Song about the Southern Song capital Hangzhou. And both of these works um, describe with great um, color and vibrancy the, the life uh, in, in these capital cities in terms of entertainments, food, um, commerce, people's daily lives. They're very rich sources. Um, and it had been mined for historian, by historians and others um, uh, to do lots of, of different kinds of studies. The other source, Hong Mai, uh, the Ijianzhi, uh, often translated as Record of the Listener, is not um, particularly focused on cities at all, but more on what the author describes as tales he's been told, but that reveal a great deal about people's religious ideas, uh, in ways that we can't access from standard historical sources and um, and much more about the li daily lives of people, maybe even the senior side, crimes and so on, uh, of, of that we don't hear about in standard uh, historical works. Um, in terms of society in the Tang Song transition, the major changes, and I'm, I'm greatly oversimplifying here, but um, this is the, the uh, large picture of how society changed between the Tang and the Song during these 500 years. Um, the old Tang aristocracy, which had held power by virtue of its um, uh, birth, that is people born of noble birth, were able to exercise um, influence in society, hold important political positions, 
and also um, acquire wealth, were replaced by the Song period by uh, a new meritocratic elite whose status and power in society was gained through their skills uh, as demonstrated in success in the civil service examination, which is also a hallmark uh, of, of society and institutional development in the Song period. Finally, the um, important topic politically of the reunification of the empire, which I will deal with a little bit more in detail uh, next, uh, that is the, obviously a uh, key to um, the kind of end point of the Tang Song transition. Um, and to uh, go back to this uh, familiar trope for the Song of civilian dominance over the military, which it was understood that the empire was unified by the military, but it was ruled by the civil bureaucrats who had acquired their positions through the examination system. So um, what, what did reunification mean here? Um, the 10th century interregnum, which is portrayed here to some extent in the map on the right-hand side, uh, is usually referred to as the five dynasties period or the period of the five dynasties and 10 kingdoms. And it's really only about a half century, the first um, half of the 10th century, and usually regarded um, in traditional histories as an interregnum between the Tang and the Song. Just, and the Tang officially came to an end in 907. So you just have this relatively short period of time uh, in which the North was divided among a series of five different dynasties who fought with each other over laying claim to their legitimacy as heirs of the mandate of heaven to rule, whereas the South was divided into a series of so-called ten kingdoms, um, there, were, there were actually more than that, and followed its own kind of trajectory of social and economic and political development. But later Chinese historians who wrote about the Five Dynasties period very much emphasized the idea of dynastic legitimacy in the North and sort of disregarded the kingdoms in the South as not having any claim to legitimacy because rule always came from the North, the, the uh, claimants to the mandate of heaven. So if we think about the Song dynasty then um, as beginning, as it shows on this map, just beginning its conquest of the north, um, officially was founded in 960, but by, was not really fully integrated until 976. Sorry, let me go back here. Um, and in 976, when the South was finally incorporated into, um, under control of the government in Kaifeng. Um, Peter Lorge, in a relatively recent book, The Reunification of China, Peace Through War Under the Song Dynasty, has argued um, very um, strongly for not only the importance of war and the military in the Song period, that is undermining the conventional view of the civil dominance over the military, but also um, argued for uh, something like a long 10th century, so that he would say that the Song unification really only came to an end in 1005 with a very important treaty that the Song um, carried out with the Kitan Liao to the north. And you get a sense of the expanse of the Kitan Liao empire in the north um, through this, uh, through, even this map shows you some sense of it. And the Song through this treaty were paying um, indemnities to the Liao, substantial indemnities that were not harmful economically, but they still were an important sign that the Song were buying peace along the border although uh, there continued to be contentious uh, relations with the, the Kitan Liao. So if we move from thinking about reunification, so we accept that the Song reunified China um, in the 10th um, century, what is China in the middle imperial period? How might we think about what China meant? So what would it mean to people living in the Song Dynasty? Was it a sense of ethnic identity, even though we have to acknowledge that 
probably ethnicity was not a category that would have made any sense to people at the time, but we might, we might think about, uh, did they consider themselves Han people um, or as juxtaposed to non-Han people who belong, who were Kitan or Tangut or something else? Or did they have perhaps a, a, a stronger sense of, of the Song as a geographic identity? Was it spatial China? We might think of it. And one of the key points here is that um, the so-called 16 prefectures and thinking about the um, geographic identity, those 16 prefectures, I couldn't find a good map of them to show you, but it's in this region right around here, just north of the border that were ceded to the Khitan by one of the Northern states before the unification of the Song. And that includes the modern capital of Beijing. Uh, and those 16 prefectures continued to be a huge thorn in the side of political leaders in the Song period and a source of considerable debate about warfare um, continuing with the Liao and subsequent treaties. Um, could we think instead about political identity? Um, did the people in Song think of themselves as a state, an empire, a nation? Um, how did they conceive of themselves um, in these terms? Uh, and I will say more about the, I have the nation in scare quotes because I want to make a point about that. Um, okay, here. Um, one of the, uh, it, most important works, I think, that I'd like to talk about in terms of these kinds of questions, um, ethnic identity, geographic identity, political identity, um, is a book written by Naomi Standen, Unbounded Loyalty, that deals with frontier crossings in uh, Liao, China. It was published in 2007, um, where she looked closely at the lives and careers of several individuals who crossed those frontiers in the, in the first half of the 10th century. And she particularly focuses on the concept of loyalty. Uh, and her conclusion from looking at these um, people's lives was that they followed a concept of loyalty to a particular political or military leader, but that they moved across the borders um, quite easily and could also switch their allegiance from one leader to another, depending on what, um, what the circumstances were. And so she argues that it wasn't really until the mid 10th century that this um, sense of identity with particular cultural affiliations and political groupings shifted to a much more um, concrete binary opposition between Song and Liao. So her argument would be that there were very fluid boundaries, if you will, in the early half of the 10th, in the first half of the 10th century um, that conceived of loyalty in terms of, of individual loyalties to particular leaders and not um, necessarily an affiliation with a particular state um, that's defined by Song and Liao borders. To follow on that, um, but taking it in a somewhat different direction is a, a more recent work by Nicholas Tackett, um, The Origins of the Chinese Nation. And, and I would put uh, nation in scare quotes again. I think many people would not necessarily agree with his notion of an early um, kind of sense of nation in, in China during this period. Nonetheless, what I wanted to bring out about the work he's done is the importance of archeological materials in the kind of argument that he's crafting and. Um, Nick Tackett e examined reports from over a thousand uh, tombs along the Song Liao border, um, particularly in the area of the 16, the so-called 16 prefectures, um, looking for differences between Khitan and North Chinese or Han tombs. 
and trying to find out whether there were clear um, delineations of concentrations of, of Khitan as opposed to North Chinese in terms of mortuary practices, that is, how did they bury their dead? And what can we learn from examining these tombs and the um, artifacts in the tombs about the cultural practices and habits or what he calls cultural repertoires of people? Were they more Khitan? And were those identified in a certain area? Were they more Han? Chinese that were those in a certain area, even though these were along the, the border area. And he concludes that, in fact, there were differences and that you can identify these cultural repertoires in different geographical ranges. Uh, and one example of this would be the Khitan Liao were very well known as um, promoters of Buddhism and uh, responsible for um, uh, sculptures and pagodas and so on, but you tend to find, as he does at least in these reports from the tombs, that Khitan followed much more Buddhist mortuary practices, that is the Buddhist, Buddhists cremated their dead, and that would be fo followed unlike the Han Chinese who would follow um, probably what we might call more Confucian burial practices. So I wanted to to use this really as an illustration of how archaeology can help us flesh out, can help us um, not simply flesh out, but see differently what we might understand about history in this period from written historical sources. Um, Tackett argues that in the conclusion that, of his book that there was a consciousness, at least among educated Song people, of a, a spatial definition of, of the Song as a territory coterminous with political and, and with ethnic and cultural identity. Um, okay, so let us uh, say more about uh, who the Khitan were, because this is also an area where archaeology has had a tremendous influence in expanding our vision of, of this empire. And uh, this map I, I use just to show the territorial extent of the Khitan, the darker area is the Khitan homelands. And one of the ways to think about who the Khitan were, and I've used here, I've used the more conventional spelling K-H-I-T-A-N, but I offer these other two spellings in case you would run into them, uh, alternative spellings. Um, the old name Cathay, which I think most people in the audience have probably heard of, and probably more generically for China, uh, was actually used by Europeans in the Mongol area in, in the time of Marco Polo uh, to refer to the northern part of China. But this term actually derives from Kitai, the Khitan people who founded the Liao dynasty. So just, you know, as a way of indicating that their, you know, their presence was, was known and acknowledged at the time. And I, their history is part of the um, authoritative Cambridge History of China, of volume six, which is entitled Alien Regimes and Border States. Um, covering the, the 10th century through the end of the Mongol period. And it was published about a generation or so in 1994 and based, some of the scholarship was written well before that. Um, but I think the title is also very telling about a view of these states like the Khitan Liao as alien regimes and border states, uh, which are treated in this volume, that, which deals with um, the Liao, the Jin, the, the Tangut, Shisha, and the Mongols as well. Um, so what, what have we learned, though, about the, the, the Khitan Liao? And I would say when I look at this map, um, I, I think of beginning um, studying Chinese history in college or even in graduate school, we saw maps of Song China that you could see a little bit on the border was, was the Liao. And I had no idea at the time of the expanse. I think most people didn't who studied China of the great expanse of, of the uh, Khitan Liao. 
And yet, already in 1949, there's a pathbreak, a landmark social history of the Kitan Liao um, by Carl Wittfogel, who is very well known for other reasons as well, and his Chinese colleague Feng Jiasheng, uh, who used and really translated uh, most of the of the Liao, the official Liao history in the Chinese uh, historical records to um, compile this. It's really an ethnographic study, if you will, of, of the Kitan Liao. But you can see that the title also says History of Chinese Society, the Liao. Um, so it's the Liao as important in China's history, but even though it actually is more about the Liao, but the title itself gives away the framework for the time. But 1949 is, you know, a very important year for lots of reasons, but um, it marks uh, a very important work that's still referred to um, in, uh, uh, it, for people who study the Kitan Liao. But beginning in um, the late 20th century, the latter 20th century, there were, although they weren't published widely in China until after the Cultural Revolution, but there began to be um, excavations of archaeological sites, linguistic studies of the Liao script and language, um, epigraphical studies, so taking um, stone inscriptions to be used as historical sources, and the material culture that came from uh, Liao tombs that were excavated. Um, I have an example here. There was a, uh, an exhibit at the Reed College Art Gallery in 2000, um, and also a conference that this exhibition catalog um, is related to differences preserved that uh, dealt with reconstructed tombs from both the Liao and Songa. So it was one of the first exhibits um, in the West. I mean, there were major exhibits at uh, national museums as well coming in the 2000s. Um, so that has been going on in, in the current century. But I wanted to also note that in preparing for this talk, I noticed that on the Asia Society website, um, there's an essay still by a very highly regarded um, scholar that is entitled still China's Liao Dynasty. And yes, the, the Liao took on a dynastic name and ruled as a dynasty, but it was not China's. Liao dynasty. I don't think anybody would accept that really. So I found it kind of, well, quite outdated, as a matter of fact. So um, just to give a, a quick flavor of some of the artifacts that I'm talking about here um, and encourage people to go further into this, I just got a notice for a, an online symposium on Khitan studies that will take place next weekend for which I have signed up. So there's lots going on in the field. And then I'll just show a couple of examples here from the Inner Mongolia Museum. Uh, the tomb wall painting here that portrays Khitan people and this very beautiful uh, green glazed ceramic animal headed vase. Uh, that's one of the finest uh, examples I've seen of, of Liao ceramics. Um, and I, I would also say that um, there has been some work done on the portrayal of the Khitan Liao in the People's Republic of China in <clears throat> a national museum as opposed to provincial or regional museums where the national museum really has to take pains to fit the Khitan Liao into the national narrative of China. But regional museums or provincial museums may have different um, goals and purposes to highlight their own regional um, cultures uh, and rather than simply fitting into a national narrative. So that's an interesting topic, very much so in its own right. And so I just wanted to give a couple of, of examples also of the kinds of material culture that we have from the Liao that are studied by architectural historians, art historians, and others. Um, the Liao, as I said earlier, promoted Buddhism. One of the most uh, well-known examples of the pagodas they built was the uh, Yingxian timber pagoda in Shanxi, 
that was built in the uh, mid 11th century. And this very fine example of a glazed ceramic uh, Lohan figure from Kobe that's currently in the British Museum. So just to give you a little flavor of, of uh, what the Liao material culture uh, offers for us to study. Going back then to archaeology and what it can uh, tell us, what it illuminates in new ways about topics for which we have limited or non-existent um, written sources, it has been customary to think about, we know that the Liao established five capitals. Um, they uh, also, in a way that the Sung had a major capital, Kaifeng, but it also had multiple capitals. And so typically, the Liao were seen to also have established five capitals modeled on Chinese urban form. In other words, they would be political centers um, and commercial hubs, but walled cities very much uh, following the model of Chinese cities. And the southern capital, interestingly here, uh, of, the, of the Liao, one of their five capitals, is actually the same site as uh, where uh, the city of Beijing is now. Um, archaeology, though, and this quite recent archaeological work using remote sensing, aerial photography, and so on, has shown that the Kitan Liao's adapted urban forms to suit their own needs. And so, yes, it's true that they would have um, some of their capitals that had to incorporate places for um, Han population um, and people from other uh, groups to live alongside the Kitan would have certain quarters of the cities for that. But beyond that kind of issue, what this more recent archaeology has shown is that Liao emperors, in fact, ruled from itinerant camps in the grasslands, while the formal capitals, the cities that we see depicted on this map, in fact, were likely to be ancestral homelands or burial sites of uh, their own ancestors with sometimes specific administrative functions, but that the emperors, the actual rule came from mobile camps that would be very much in line with um, a pastoral nomadic way of life. And one of the most interesting kind of textual examples, references we have to that, is um, a northern Song envoy going to meet with the Liao ruler, uh, and that is one of the sources we have for contact with the Liao. One of the most important ones are travel uh, travelers, but also particularly diplomatic envoys. He met with the Liao ruler in his camp, his mobile camp. He didn't go to even the supreme capital in order to meet the Liao ruler. Um, I'll quickly go through that the, another group that was very important for the on the borders of the Sung, the Tangut Shisha, uh, from around um, 1000 in this portrayal. And I will just say a couple of things. This is a rich uh, culture in its own right that has been studied a great deal by particularly Russian Sinologists. And here I just wanted to feature the, the um, Tangut Shisha um, are often regarded as a Buddhist state. They were very strong promoters of Buddhism in this image of Shakyamuni on the left-hand side, uh, also from the Inner Mongolia Museum. And the, the scripture in Tangut a script, a Buddhist scripture on the right-hand side, um, the Tangut script is still worked on being deciphered by people who are known as Tangutologists. Um, and as I said, a lot of these sources too uh, were carted off into um, Russia and so are held in, in Russian libraries and studied by Russian, Russian scholars. But there's also an international community studying the Tanguts, which we know a great deal about through their archaeology as, as well. So uh, finally, the Jurchen Jin dynasty, then another group, yet the Jurchen, 
uh, tribal confederation under the Wanyan clan began to form in the 11th century. They were underlings of the Khitan Liao until they rebelled against the Khitan and came from the borderlands between northern, the northern Korean peninsula and what in modern times Manchuria. Uh, and they are the ones who conquered the northern part of the Song and formed their own Jin dynasty in the north. Um, and I wanted, again, we'll just illustrate with one example, the um, tremendously rich artifacts of the Church and Jin era that have been unearthed by archaeologists. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to this exhibit in New York City um, in 2012, so almost 10 years ago, and, um, to, about uh, ex tomb decor from the Jin, from, from the Shanxi Museum. And um, like many other archaeological excavations in China, this was accidentally discovered, this particular tomb here, um, uh, during the digging of a foundation for a chemical factory in Shanxi. And it just gives you a sense of the portrayal of actors. And some tombs include actual theaters in the tomb, which is a hugely interesting topic in and of its own right, um, where the um, I think scholars have different ideas about what this may have meant, that were the theaters in the tombs for the deceased to um, be entertained in the afterlife. Uh, did We do know that, that sometimes descendants um, held theatrical productions at the tomb site, um, but theater was a very important part of Jurchen Jin culture building on Northern Song and continuing into the Yuan period. But one of the richest sources of what we can know about this theater is from the portrayal of actors and theaters in the tomb artifacts. So finally, with the Mongol Empire, um, we come to then the, the sort of final conquest of the, of the Song and uh, the Mongols also, of course, first conquered the Jin in the north, um, beginning with the um, campaigns of Temujin, who became known as Chinggis Khan after 1206. Uh, beginning here, this map shows the um, kind of groundwork laid for the, the building of the Mongol Empire by Chinggis Khan before his death uh, in 1227. Uh, it was, however, his grandson, Kublai Khan, who became ruler of the Yuan dynasty in China, uh, beginning his reign in 1260, but declaring the Yuan period in 1271 and taking that name for his dynasty. And this, I include the, his wife's portrait. These are very famous portraits, well known, because uh, Chabi was also a, an extremely influential person uh, in terms of religion and culture, as well as politics um, in the, at the UN court uh, and um, well, well regarded politically as, as part of, of the history of Kublai's reign. Um, the Mongol Empire, as we know, extended uh, into the, uh, across Eurasia and on, onto the edges of Europe. And beginning in 1260, when Kublai Khan um, became Great Khan and um, began to rule what, what eventually was the Yuan dynasty a decade later, he was Great Khan over all of the other Khans who ruled the other parts of the Mongol Empire. And they had a certain autonomy independence. They were theoretically subordinate to Kublai as the great Khan. Um, and so the empire was unified, but I think many people would regard the Mongol empire after 1260 as really um, several in, more or less independent Khanates. The Ilkhans in Persia um, you know, pursued their own policies, they existed in a very, very different world. The Chagatai Khanate in Central Asia, or the Kipchak Khanate, the gold, so-called Golden Horde in the area of Russia, and the Yuan Dynasty, um, even though it was the domain of the Great Khan, in theory, over all the others, 
um, it you could certainly question the uh, unity of the Mongol Empire in this period. You can see on this map highlighted also the Mongol capital, Karakoram, along the Orkhan River in the north, that was its kind of own capital, but Beijing um, was really built as an imperial capital on the foundations of Dadu, which had been the capital of the Jurchen Jin before. And as we know, this area was even before the Jurchen was a capital for the Kitan Liao. And so that city has very early foundations, but all of them in uh, occupation by so-called non-Han non peoples. Um, this map also portrays by the red um, routes across Eurasia, building on the ancient Silk Roads, but these were very much revived during the Mongol Empire, um, given the relative security and stability that was allowed uh, merchant caravans along these routes under the control of the Mongols. This map also shows uh, very nicely the important maritime routes that the Mongol Yuan took um, really based on, well, they took over the Song Navy when they conquered the Song, and it sort of built their own um, navigational uh, abilities based on what had been already existing for the Yuan, uh, sorry, for the Song period. But they um, made them more institutionalized, extending their um, diplomatic efforts into the Sultanate of Delhi and to set throughout Southeast Asia. We know they attempted unsuccessfully to invade Java, also to invade Japan, but they nevertheless pursued uh, diplomatic relations with peoples to in other parts of, um, of the Indian Ocean world. Uh, so those navigational routes were also very important. And I'll quickly, this map illustrates more or less the overland route goods, commodities that were traded. And you can um, assume also that many of these goods were also traded by sea, by the so-called Maritime Silk Road. And we can see important points here, locations of the Maritime Silk Road, maritime networks of trade, uh, just identifying particular points that were important as either sources of goods or coastal ports along the these trading routes that um, persisted throughout the, the Yuan period. And I want to just quickly focus on a couple of uh, examples of the importance of nautical archaeology. So this is another um, subfield of archaeology that has been very important in helping us um, deepen and refine our understanding of maritime trade in this era. Um, the two very well-known uh, 10th century shipwrecks have been excavated in the Java Sea that include much Chinese cargo, but also cargo from West Asia, from India, and particularly Islamic artifacts. So that we know there was an extensive trade in religious goods. And it also suggests the importance of Islam alongside uh, the trading goods from China. And there were also um, Islamic communities within China. The belly tomb wreck is one of the best known, um, also um, found in Indonesian waters. This ship, which has been reconstructed here um, from what was found underwater, contained a, a Chinese cargo, uh, and much of, most of it was Changsha ware from a kiln that would have been internal in the modern city of Changsha, provincial capital of Hunan, in the interior of China today. And this just shows you one of the um, jars found that had bowls with this particular design from the, the Changsha kilns. So nautical archaeology has helped us understand um, track trade routes far more um, specifically than we would have been able to do from written records. Uh, the recovery of ships helps us understand uh, more about the origins of merchants. There were largely Arab Persian merchants before the Song period. Beginning in the Song period, Chinese merchants participated in these maritime networks across the Indian Ocean, but there were also South Asian, Southeast Asian merchants who played a big role in this maritime trade. And the ship's contents, of course, also reveal the kinds of goods that were traded.
into the Yuan period, one of the most famous um, shipwrecks that's been excavated is that of, of the Sinan shipwreck found on the coast of uh, Korea, portrayed here on the map. Um, that was on, en route from Ningbo to Hakata in Japan, from Ningbo along the coast of China to Hakata in Japan. Um, the glazed stoneware jar on the right is a very fine example of, of, a, of a late Song, early Yuan era uh, object that was, is, um, was in Japan for storing tea leaves that's in the Freer Gallery at the Smithsonian. But the, the, this um, jar from the Sinan shipwreck is a similar kind of jar, just giving us a sense of what might the goods on these ships have been used for in the destinations uh, where they were uh, being traded. And because I know I'm, I'm running short on time here, I want to quickly, and I really don't want this to be an afterthought at all, but I want to at least offer an illustration of how gender ideas about gender, what we understand about particularly the lives of women in the Song period has been amplified by the innovative, creative use of familiar texts. So here I'm speaking about particularly Beverly Bossler's work using poetry written by men, um, because we really don't have any, um, we don't have written work of any substance by women in the Song period. You do in the, in the Ming and Qing periods, but Song and Yuan, little next to nothing. But um, Beverly Bossler has shown how you can use poetry, for example, uh, written by men, um, maybe about a favored concubine, for example, uh, can shed light on how women were embedded in, but were also essential parts of men's social and literary networks. Um, and even if they didn't leave written works of their own, um, sometimes the poems talk about the, the talent and skill, literary and other kinds of skills that women had. So this is offered at least uh, another way of thinking about how we can still use traditional texts, but do different things with them. One of her conclusions that's, that's quite important is that um, the trope of the faithful wife, um, the faithful widow who refuses to remarry after the death of her husband, um, were held up not only as models of fidelity um, and chastity, um, but became for men at the time exemplars of political loyalty. And this was certainly a time when men's political loyalty was very much in question, given the transition from the, the Song to the Yuan period and questions of loyalty to a fallen dynasty or transferring loyalty to a new ruler, the Yuan. And I'm just, I'm using this 10th century painting just to illustrate men and women together who would be engaged in entertainment and conversation of the type that is being um, written about undoubtedly in these poems. And then one last point about women uh, equally path-breaking and, and a generation ago, Patricia Ivory's The Inner Quarters um, helped us think about how we can find women if we if we look for where the women are in society we can learn a great deal about their agency not just their victimhood but their agency and she argued that marriage was the key to understanding um, women's agency in family and kinship networks and in society at large and a uh, you know, she does pay attention to the commodification of women's labor in the marketplace, their textile labor, particularly within the confines of the domestic household, um, as Beverly Bossler has dealt with their role in society over the Sung and Yuan as um, courtesans and concubines as well as wives. And I would add also that another way to think about how we can find more about the lives of women uh, Bettine Burge has worked on property uh, inheritance laws changing and how that affected the lives of women, but making the point that inheritance laws in the Song period were quite favorable to women. And there's a lot of dispute about exactly what all this means, but it does illustrate how even 
uh, legal cases can be a way to get at some of these issues that we otherwise would not have access to. And I want to close here because I know I'm running a little bit over with um, <clears throat> some big questions to think about, maybe to carry away. So I, I would, this map is from an article by Naomi Standen, whose work I cited earlier on the Kitan Liao um, border crossings, frontier crossings. Um, she's currently engaged in writing a history of Eastern Eurasia from 600 to 1350, as she says, without using the word China. And, um, you know, I do find this highly impractical, but I get her point and I have tried to emulate her um, guidance to some extent in my own work. Uh, I can't do it completely, and I, I don't think I need to, but this map um, kind of illustrates what she's talking about. Uh, you notice that there are no defined borders, but there is Tang, there is Liao, so this is, of course, for an earlier period than this, so for the Tang era, so uh, looking at, say, about the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries, um, and Goguryeo, the state on the, on the, northern part of the Korean peninsula. There's another state of Baohai, Parhai, Bohai in Chinese, um, the Liao. She's arguing that we should use names that refer to political regimes, but think about the lives of people who lived under these political regimes as not confined to the political borders that inevitably follow our usage of terms like China or Japan or Korea. And it, when I first heard this, I thought, well, I, I don't mean China, modern China nation state when I use that term in the Song, but inevitably it carries a kind of hardened border notion with it that I think we do well to question and, and try to think beyond. I like the title of this article, Coloring Outside the Lines. Um, something we learned about as children. Um, anyway, not to do, but um, she's deliberately doing. And so one very final uh, question has been brought out in terms of thinking about what the Mongol Empire in China meant, the Yuan Dynasty. And I said earlier that um, Kublai Khan declared the Yuan Dynasty in 1271 as he was great Khan though, of the entire Mongol Empire. One scholar um, has uh, argued that the term Da Yuan, which was what he used to name the new dynasty, Great Yuan, um, actually uh, was a translation of the Yeke Mongol Ulus, the great Mongol nation. And so when he used Da Yuan, he wasn't referring to the Yuan dynasty China, but he was really referring to all of the Mongol empire that was his domain as great Khan. Others wouldn't agree with this. Uh, Timothy Brook, though, has written recently about uh, this term Da Yuan, and the term da is used in other contexts as well. The Jin used it, uh, the Tanguts used it, the Ming uses it, afterwards Da Ming. And so he is arguing for the idea that we might try to think about the Mongol Empire as a political formation that doesn't necessarily fit into a definition uh, kind of European Western history derived definition of what is an empire, but in fact represents a new kind of political formation that integrates an agrarian bureaucratic state, China, with nomadic pastoral organizations in a new kind of political formation that we may or may not call an empire, but may say a nomadic empire. But um, I think he would argue that it goes beyond the use of the term empire as well. All right, with that, I'm sorry to run over, but um, I hope at least I've stimulated your interest and I'll be very happy to take any questions uh, and I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, you are welcome to go 
longer. It was a fascinating <laughs> subject. So um, we are, um, as Linda mentioned, we're going to go into our Q&A session. I'd like to start off with um, one question. It's from JJ. What became of the Kitan Liao in the wake of the Jurchen Rebellion? Uh, a group of the Kitan Liao moved out to the west and established their own state temporarily, but the Kitan Liao pretty much disappear from history, I guess, from the record after about 1400. Um, so at least in terms of having any, any particular um, uh, polity that they're identified with. Great, thank you so much. Um, next question from Thomas. What do you look forward to learning about in Scotland this year, especially with respect to Byzantium and interactions between the two empires slash cultures? Great question. It's a tough question. Well, I attended a, a workshop two years ago. Uh, gosh, it's soon three years ago. Uh, there, as part of this project, which I find fascinating and exciting and wonderful, the um, comparing Song and Byzantium, uh, so bringing experts together from the two sides. And I read a lot about uh, Byzantine history before I went because I was a discussant. And um, I would hope to uh, continue to learn more about Byzantium. I have a side career as a world historian and a good deal of frustration with dealing with world history on such a large scale. So I find it um, the perfect kind of approach to look at comparison where you bring experts together from two fields and get them to talk to each other. And it's actually a very hard thing to do because I spent a lot of time reading up on the field of Byzantium and finding that there were long passages in Greek in articles that I, I thought, well, you know, they should translate them. But then I know that sometimes in the things I read, um, there's lots of terminology that wouldn't be familiar to someone from outside the field. In any case, um, the focus of this project is really um, intellectual culture. So it's looking at um, kind of Confucian ideas in terms of the Song, but not just Confucian ideas, but religious ideas as well, and the counterparts, if you will, in, in Byzantium. So anyway, I think it's a very exciting project. And I hope to be able to continue to be part of it, pandemic permitting, as I said. Moving on to the next one. Uh, Wendy says, thanks for your talk. My question is a practical one. Although the concern for imposing modern nation state border ideas on the past is a good one, how does one talk more generally about these periods without doing that? Or is it mostly a concern for specialists? That's, a, that's a, a good question, and, and I think I at least started to um, address that at the very end and saying in my own work, I, it does help me in my work, I'm not sure this will quite answer your question, but um, to, as I said, consciously avoid saying in Korea or in Japan, but be specific, just say geographically identify the Korean peninsula or the Japanese archipelago, um, but I, I, there are times when even in the um, specific research, I can't avoid saying China. So I think in yes, I, as I think I said, it's it's somewhat impractical. Uh, I don't know whether this can be carried off in the project that's underway um, on on uh, Eastern Eurasia. But uh, you know, as I said, I. Initially, my reaction was, well, I can still use the word China, and I know it doesn't mean the modern Chinese nation state, but, um, you know, I think this is a, it's problematic, but I think it's worth the effort to consciously keep in mind as much as possible uh, and try to avoid using the term or thinking in terms of hard borders, but I think it will take another uh, probably a generational shift for anything beyond that um, to develop enough where we are really thinking, I think as Naomi Standen is trying to propose, and I don't know how successful she will be, um, 
that we think not in terms of blocks, like political blocks, but layers. And I think maybe partly an answer to your question is the use of China tends to focus on a political boundary, whatever period you're talking about, and trying to get beyond that political boundary is um, something that I think we're all, many of us are making conscious efforts to do. I don't know if that completely answers your question, but at any rate, I think that's what I have to say about it. That's great, thank you. Our next question comes from Ad. With empire so large, how was loyalty maintained among those tasked with control? Ah, that's a good question. I think it probably, uh, huh, if you're talking, it depends on what you're talking about, I guess. The Mongol Empire, that probably is it, the, the largest. Um, you know, I, there are different kinds of loyalty and, and many, many different ways. I think reward is probably one of the biggest motivators. Um, people were rewarded, uh, Mongol elites were rewarded with territory, with um, wealth, uh, control of their of populations themselves. Uh, they also were awarded titles, let's see, within the Yuan rule of China. Uh, they were given appointments, posts in government. And so I think as with any society, your loyalty to the state, authority, your acknowledging its legitimacy is very much tied to what you get out of it, right? And how stable your own position is. And if that authority begins to weaken, you might question your loyalty to it. Or if you suddenly don't get the rewards that you're expecting, then you might, um, uh, your loyalty might begin to weaken and disintegrate. Uh, that's probably the best answer. I, can, I think it's a very uh, complex set of things that that but rewards of various kinds that people are given to um to gain their loyalty uh for which legitimacy in a in a kind of intellectual sense is uh important but i think the real material rewards are also a very important part of this Thank you. We have another question. Uh, this one comes from Tian Chu. Regarding Song women as seen by men and arts, etc., Li Qingzhou was a famous female poet whose works were in my high school curriculum in Hong Kong. Yes. 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 She's a very important poet. And I, I neglected, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and we do have her works, and there's a lot. Of, of written about her and yes she's very important um i think we have to acknowledge her as as a very exceptional in terms of the fact that she has writings that that were preserved um but if we're trying to look at the lives of women in general uh in in song society it, that's where we don't have written sources and and by that i mean uh, records that testify to women's lives beyond that that very, uh, I would have to say, isolated example of Li Qingzhou. But you're absolutely right and that I, I should bring that out, that that is important. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, our next question comes from John. What was the Liao language? Did they leave a written record? Yes, uh, very few written documents. That's a good question. And I went through this so quickly that I didn't go into it. Um, there has been extensive study. The Liao developed two scripts, the so-called large script and small script, to transcribe their language. Um, and that script has been more or less uh, deciphered. Uh, there are people who specialized in this. Um, uh, Daniel Kane, I think, is the best known uh, of the scholars who work on Khitan script and language. Yes, so um, their own language began to be written down 
and this certainly was a, a result of their encounter with with um, with the Song and with Song's predecessors. And um, so yes, but they left relatively few written records. Um, this is not true of of the um, Tanguts or the or the Jurchen, but the Liao. We have very few written records, so we have to really rely on. Um, epigraphy, that there are um, stone inscriptions or um, other kinds of material artifacts. Um, but we do have knowledge of their, of their written language, yes. Great, thank you. We are um, typically nearing our uh, end of our Q&A, but we do have a few more questions. So we're gonna try to get to them. Um, I think they're really interesting questions. Um, so the next one comes from Joanne. This is all quite fascinating. I really like the interest in recent years about the influence of North and Central Asian peoples in China. How has this altered and expanded our understanding of political and economic relations in Song China itself? Uh, the knowledge of, of the peoples I was talking about, is that correct? Yes? Jennifer, was that the question? I'm sorry, could you just... Oh. Repeat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, I'm sorry, the interest in recent years about the influence of North and Central Asian peoples in China. Mm -hmm. How has that altered and expanded our understanding of political and economic relations? Within China, within this, yes. group, for example, right? Okay. Yes. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I think um, I, certainly the political um, history of the Song has been greatly modified, revised by, by knowing more about uh, the Kitan Liao. Uh, I think the book that I cited early uh, on in the talk by Peter Lorge went a long way toward making that point about the importance of the military and warfare in the Song. And a lot of his book deals with, and there are other works by him and others that amplify this as well, um, that the military actually was very important in the Song and continued to be, so that the Song politics was more dominated by concerns about warfare. I mean, wars with the Tanguts in the mid 11th century were of enormous importance in relation to what was going on in political reforms within the Song government. So, warfare with peoples on the borders was politically. Uh, very important. Uh, in terms of the economy, trade, and I think we know a lot more about the nature of trade, overland trade largely, with peoples um, to the north, uh, northeast and northwest, uh, trading relationships that went on despite uh, border conflicts and warfare. Uh, so in terms of the, of the Song economy, yes, we know more the, about the kinds of goods, commodities that were traded with those peoples, the more we um, uncover in terms of archeological excavations and other kinds of, of non-text sources. So yes, thank you. I, I hope that answered your question. I think in both political and economic terms, it has really made a big difference to know more about the um, peoples on the borders. Thank you so much for that answer. Our next question comes from Jeff. Very interesting, thanks. How are these reconfigurations of Chinese dynastic history received within the PRC? Any cross-fertilization with the new Qing history, in quotes, regarding later <laughs> time? <laughs> Any interest well, from Korean scholars, etc.? cetera? Uh, in the uh, new, yes, okay, sure. I, I can, I think I can answer that. Um, I, I don't want to deal with the new Qing history. That's a, a problem all of its own, and, and people who are Qing specialists can speak to that uh, far better. Um, I, I think uh, for the Song and Yuan periods, um, well, the Yuan is more problematic. Uh, yes, that is true. But but let's just say for, for purposes of argument right now that the Song um, is, you know, studies in the People's Republic of China have just hugely um, exploded in, in Song history. Um, and I think 
th there was an absolute openness to the idea of the Tang Sung transition, to the idea of the Sung, of course, as a, a kind of early modern, sort of it had the features of what were identified with the modern as Naito Konan proposed in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but clearly, uh, and in Korea as well, I mean, there's, there's a, as probably many people know, highly developed uh, field of Sinology of Chinese studies in Korea, as well as in Japan, there's a long, deep tradition of studies of China in Japan. And the scholarship, um, and of course in Taiwan, of course, the scholarship in all of those places has really um, expanded a lot in terms of, of the Song period and the Yuan. Now, I would say for um, studies of the Yuan in China, it's still very difficult to, um, how shall I say this? For it, I think it's problematic for scholars to uh, go too far in asserting uh, something distinctive to even the Mongols other than conquerors. I mean, it's very difficult because there are obviously different levels of political sensitivity and some scholars work, you know, they, they, they have a very deep knowledge of texts and they do excellent work um, on the on the Yuan period, but it's it's more sensitive. Um, and I'm just thinking of an example I I uh, was I learned about recently uh, from a, a museum in France, um, a, a regional museum that was having a, a Mongol exhibit, Mongol Empire exhibit and borrowing things from China, but then the Chinese insisted that they not use um, anything but Yuan Dynasty. And so there, you know, a, a, this sense of uh, kind of ownership, appropriation of the Mongols in China, uh, even to the extent of not acknowledging Mongol. I mean, it was a very extreme example, but I think, um, the Tang Sung transition idea is something that was certainly uh, welcomed and there's nothing problematic about it. And in fact, it was super welcomed, I think, in the People's Republic because it fits very well with the notion of China as kind of an early modern and kind of ahead of the rest of the world. And as many people would have argued that it, it, it was perhaps. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Uh, that was great again. Um, I have two uh, comments regarding the maritime uh, aspect of history. Uh, one comes from Jim. Uh, he says, loved your inclusion of maritime archaeology in examples from shipwrecks. And he mentions, Murray, excuse me, maritime archaeologist Jim Delgado, who investigated Kublai Khan's lost fleet yes. and the author yes. of War at Sea. And yes. also Joanne adds that I love this talk, thank you. The maritime trade in the Song Jin Ren period is quite interesting. It is great to see how it underpins the amazing development of the Ming Navy. Mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering if you have more to add to that or can speak more about that. Um, I, I can't really, I, I, I feel in a way that it, this has been such a superficial skirting across a lot of different topics, but I hope that it's you know, given at least people a framework to you know, stimulate interest in, in these directions. And so I've just skirted these topics. I am aware of the Delgado work. Yes, and there, that is something I could have brought out too. There's really been terrific work done um, from the seeking of the Mongol fleet and the um, invasion of Japan uh, that's um, fairly recent. But yes, we can know a great deal about not just the trade, you're right, but um, other aspects of, of maritime, the maritime world. And I think this is something that has been less appreciated in the past about the Mongol Empire, which is always referred to as a land-based, you know, the large, one of the phrases commonly used, the large, largest contiguous land-based empire in world history. And so thinking about the maritime side of, of the UN, of the Mongols is, is I think, very important. 
So thank you for those comments. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are at the end of our Q&A session. So I'm just going to, um, we have a couple comments I'd like to share. Uh, it's from Terry, who says, great presentation and excellent maps. Thank you. And Edie also says, fascinating and informative. Uh, so uh, our audience has really spoken for us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walton, for giving us this talk today and answering all of our questions. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing? No, just thank you very much for attending. And I see the sun is coming out. So I hope this was a good use of the rainy morning. And now you can go out into the sunshine or come to the tea house for a bit. Yes. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you again. Um, we really appreciate you coming and sharing the space with us. Um, as uh, Linda mentioned, uh, we do have our tea house. That'll be just in a few minutes after uh, our webinar closes. So if you're able to join us for that, just remember, go back to your registration confirmation email, and there should be a second link if you scroll down for the tea house. Um, and yeah, I think, oh, thank you so much for the slide to remind me. Um, our next presentation is February 5th, and that is going to be by Dan Lucas on auspicious chops and seals. All right. Um, if you um, want to go to our um, website uh, for more information, that's uh, on that slide. It's www.firstsaturdaypdx.org. And also, again, if you have any questions about this talk and you think about it later, also feel free to email us at firstsaturdaypdx at gmail.com.